Good, mo good morning, everyone, and uh, perhaps afternoon if you're on the East Coast. My name is Fiona uh, Hasler mckenzie I'm uh, in my office at the University of Western Australia, which is located in Wajak country, which is part of the larger Noongar nation that incorporates most of southwestern Western Australia. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, on the lands that we all meet across the nation and pay our respects to elders um, past, present and emerging. Uh, before we start this session on regional economic development, which is program one for the CRC, uh, just some housekeeping um, uh, guidelines. Please use the live Q&A button to um, record your questions for the presenters during their presentation. There will be a Q&A, a brief Q&A at the end of each presentation where the uh, chairs and presenters will address the questions. Uh, the discussion forum is for general comments to interact with other attendees but not questions. And at the closing, um, in attendees uh, can use the chat and meeting hub. Um, so to start with, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Linda Dawson. Linda Dawson is the Deputy Director General of the uh, Department, West Australian Department of Industry, Science and Innovation at the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation. It's a role uh, which she commenced after working for 25 years in the resource and utilities sector. She's had various operational and senior leadership roles in this time, spanning everything from large scale mergers uh, and acquisitions to integrating uh, integrations and marketing. Uh, Linda has uh, a great interest in the CRC, and which is one of the reasons why we thought it would be terrific to have her insights um, this morning. So thank you, Linda, for being part of this forum. Thanks very much, Fiona, for that warm introduction, and Kaya Wanju, uh, everyone who is online. Um, I too would like to acknowledge uh, that I'm on Wajak Noongar country and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and also acknowledge their continuing connection to the land, uh, sea and culture here in WA. Um, the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation is the lead agency for, um, for implementing the Diversified WA, the West Australian Government's Economic Development Framework. <coughs> I'm just going to, I might need you to page down for me actually. Oh no, there we go. Oh, here we are. The vision of the framework is for WA to have a strong and diversified economy, delivering secure quality jobs through increased investment across a broad range of activities. I think as most people would be aware, WA's economy is predominantly um, and currently underpinned uh, by mining and uh, energy sort of um, economic sort of outcomes, uh, most of which are regionally located with large scale operations. Released in July 2019, the Diversified WA sort of strategy and revised again in 2020 in light of the global pandemic, identifies eight external facing priority sectors where Western Australia has a competitive advantage and there are significant growth and diversification opportunities. These eight priority sectors are noted on the base of the slide uh, that you will be viewing. To drive both economic growth and social recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic, in July 2020, the WA government launched the WA Recovery Plan with the aim of improving business and consumer confidence, creating employment opportunities and promoting growth. It included a range of stimulus and support measures to develop new and established industries, including many initiatives identified in the Diversified WA framework. A number of industry specific plans have also been released by the WA government to support and underpin the state's economic diversification efforts, including the renewable hydrogen strategy and the future battery industry strategy, both launched in 2019. These set out the state's approach to becoming a significant producer, exporter and user of renewable hydrogen, future batteries and critical minerals. In 2020 and 2024, primary industries plan was developed, released in November 2020, aims to support the growth of increasingly sophisticated and globally competitive primary industries based here in WA. The WA Defence and Defence Industry Strategic Plan was released in October 2018 and provides direction across six key strategies to enable WA to be a key player in supporting the national and international defence industry 
and is supporting the state to become a principal location for the delivery of sustainment um, and shipbuilding requirements for Australia's vessels. The West Australian Aboriginal Tourism Action Plan, known as the GINA Plan, will also position Western Australia as the nation's leading destination for Aboriginal cultural tourism experiences. The GINA Plan promotes Aboriginal experiences, builds programs and pathways to increase Aboriginal participation in the tourism industry and develops new Aboriginal tourism infrastructure projects throughout the state. The WA government also recently released in October 21, the recently developed and first ever health and medical life sciences strategy to complement the vision set out and diversify WA and to build our local medical manufacturing capability. The WA government also recently released a WA supply chain development plan 21-22 to support the government's efforts to increase participation of local businesses in more diverse domestic supply chains, building on the commitments outlined in Diversify WA, the plan presents a highly targeted approach to pursuing specific domestic and global supply chain opportunities for Western Australia, businesses in both, in both established and emerging industries, of which many are located in the regions. Diversify WA highlights the important importance of cross-sector enablers such as science, innovation and technology. Building science and technology capability and investment is critical to improving productivity, safety, competitiveness and adaptability of supply chain and industry activities. WA businesses also need to innovate to capture new supply chain activities through improving their processes, developing new products and forming startups and accessing new markets. WA is a world leader in innovation and technologies applied in the resources sector and energy sector, including artificial intelligence, robots, robotics, remote operations, and microgrid management. These innovations and technologies can often transfer to other industries like agriculture, health, defence, manufacturing, and space. Leveraging WA's strong innovative technological capabilities, the WA government is working to grow the digital and capability sector into a global domain. JETSI is responsible for supporting research and development across government departments, attracting investment in Western Australia, innovation, and creating links across government agencies and between industry, research, and academic organisations at local and international levels. In 2020 to 21, we administered just over 22 million in grants to build the science and research capability in Western Australia. Our research and development innovation sort of approaches uh, statewide to stimulate growth across WA and importantly in our regions to grow capability, populations and their livability. The state government is committed to building regional economies that are entrepreneurial, creative, technology driven to create sustainable job opportunities for people in living in regional WA. Importantly, to make sure that they are sustainable and and livable to attract people to want to sort of relocate and move there. Working in partnership with the nine regional development commissions in WA, the Department of Primary Industry Resources Development is responsible for the continued growth and success of our regions. They have developed a regional development strategy that ensures that as the global economy continues to evolve a range of, and a range of opportunities arise for which our regions can enjoy a comparative advantage but the competition is fierce and success is not assured. The regional investment blueprints provide a comprehensive development plan prepared by the regional development commissions with their st key stakeholders. They outline the imperatives for growth and development in each region and provide a rich source of potential investment opportunities. Importantly, the blueprints identify opportunities across more than one region. The strategy provides a framework to prioritise and progress the opportunities with the most potential emerging from blueprints and other sources. It is a vehicle to develop a whole of state approach to matters of importance across the regions. The Regional New Industries Fund was a $4.5 million fund developed under the state government's overarching New Industries Fund. The Regional New Industries Fund aimed to catalyse Western Australia's competitiveness by building that entrepreneurial spirit and innovation and commercialisation pathways in our regions. The state government's Regional New Industries Fund provided grants to support venture creation, accelerate small to medium enterprise growth and seed innovation initiatives. 14 successful recipients 
in, in total received grants worth $1.8 million. DPIRD also continues to administer the Royalties for Regions program that focuses on job creation, utilising local capability and providing social and economic infrastructure to support our regional economies. The R for R underpins the state government's long-term commitment to developing WA's regional areas into strong and vibrant regional communities that are desirable places to live, work, play and invest. The program disperses about a million, a billion dollars annually across WA's nine regions government agency to local governments, to government agencies and not-for-profit entities to support regional projects and programs that facilitate economic, business and social development for the benefit of all West Australians. <coughs> I'm going to turn now to a, a specific example um, around a transitioning community and that's uh, the, the community of Collie. Collie, as many would know, has long been a part of the power generation sort of capability in Western Australia and is a town that was powering into a dynamic future. For more than 100 years, Collie's coal mines and coal fired power stations have generated much of the state's electricity. Now the local economy's diversification is becoming its strength. The Western Australian and global economies move to minimise greenhouse gas emissions. The Collie region's transition is attracting investment from the private sector and government, presenting a significant and unique opportunity for business investment. In December 2020, the government released Collie's Just Transition Plan. The Just Transition Plan is the state government's commitment to working with the community and the industry to deliver a just transition for the community of Collie. The purpose of a just transition is to create a strong and sustainable future for Collie as it shifts away from a dependence on coal and coal-fired energy production. While the commitment to a just transition will need to be long-term, the Just Transition Plan provides the first step of this commitment and allows a focus on actions that will help provide the foundation for a successful transition. The Just Transition Plan was developed in collaboration with the Just Transition Working Group, comprising local industry, community, union, and, and, and other key stakeholders, and it offers a project facilitation support for significant projects. JETSI with the Southwest Development Commission also administer the $18 million Collie Futures Industry Development Fund, which has grants of up to $2 million. But in terms of place-based activation, there are a wide range of programs and initiatives that may have potential to add local impact. The Pr Prospectus for Collie has a long list of programs that is four pages long, which is a fantastic outcome. There's no doubt in WA being built on mining that it will have communities that will need to consider their future post-closure in the near and in the longer term. Rehabilitating land following mining is a major and growing issue for Western Australia, with around 2.5 million hectares of land currently under active mining lease. According to the WA Biodiversity Science Institute, about 85% of mining proposals assessed by the West Australian Environmental Protection Authority have had rehabilitation and or closure requirements recommended and subsequently applied by the Minister for Environment through a ministerial statement. This is in addition to the conditions for rehabilitation and, and or closure specified under the Mining Act 1978. For successful mine closure um, to occur, it needs to be done in a very sort of collaborative manner. As, as most people know, it is a complex and costly process. Significant costs are associated with making the transition to a sustainable post mining economy. This can only be done well through active early stakeholder involvement. WA regional economies are underpinned by mining and there is a very important role for cooperative research centre and certainly time in helping to shape the dialogue around transition after mine closure and in supporting the growth of local communities to attract new industry well before mine closure. From JETSI's perspective, a couple of the priorities that the CRC could play an active role in include enabling and establishing a co-design process that identifies the best pathways for regions to benefit from a mine, mine beyond closure and during as it's transitioning, supporting industry and governments to better understand the ESG value of good mine closure practices. Advising on and building a picture of mine site restoration can be particularly restoration of Aboriginal cultural area and add value to an area. 
identifying the barriers for effective mine closure, including regulatory gaps. Active and early investment attraction to bring new sectors to the region. This needs to be done in consultation and involvement of key impacted stakeholders and the community and identifying the underpinning reskilling and training pathways to be established to underpin the new future need to be implemented early to enable a smooth and rapid transition. The topic of this CRC is tackling a significant and complex matters. The research programs of the CRCs are important because they offer the evidence base that are needed for sound future decisions by governments and stakeholders. The work over the coming years that will be undertaken by the CRC requires difficult topics to be broached. CRCs can offer a safe space for parties to solve problems and work together. Co-design is a real strength of many of the CRCs and this particular CRC also has the advantage that it can really focus on, on the regions and have a place-based focus and place-based discussion. Along the way, I, I have no doubt there will be many gaps and challenges raised and some of these may need to be addressed by government. Government agencies' roles may vary over the life of the CRC. They may never be closely involved in projects, yet nevertheless influenced by the research that you undertake. A regulator may find partnership in a CRC challenging because of the nature of their role, but it may be fitting for them to engage at a project level and in early stage discussions. I'd encourage you to consider your stakeholders in government as dynamic. They may change over time, so they might, so might their engagement, and this is okay. It needs to be continual and it needs to be consistent with, with engagement. The science portfolio in JETSI plays a, a role across WA government agencies to assist them to engage with CRCs. JETSI's door is always open. Whilst we have limited resources and we can't be in the thick of every research pro, pro, project and every CRC in the state, but we do certainly monitor the CRC landscape and where we see an important gap, we flag this to the government and to, and to the relevant ministers. JETSI is also the key funder of the WA Biodiversity Science Institute, WABC, which obviously is a part of the history of the CRC time, which is a strong connection between this and the state government. Although we are not an investor in the CRC as JETSI, uh, we are a very strong supporter of it and the work it is doing. The WA government recognises that many of our existing and emergency emerging industries rely heavily on science to thrive. As I mentioned in relation to Diversify WA, research and innovation is recognised as a key enabler in generating new technology and knowledge that not only allows our existing sectors to be more productive, efficient and competitive, but also feeds the innovation pipeline with new products and services. Effective collaboration between industry, the researchers and community through CRCs can have a real impact in the efforts to diversify the economy and creating jobs. Traditionally, WA has been the home for resources related CRCs, but this is shifting. Western Australia currently has six CRCs that are headquartered in WA, including the CRC Time. We have the Cybersecurity CRC, the Honeybee Product CRC, Minex CRC, Future Battery Industry CRC, the CRC for Transformations in Mining Economies, or TIME, and the Future Energy Export CRC. A number of these CRCs are directly connected to the WA government industry strategies, such as the FBI CRC and the Future Energy Export CRC. This has helped establish the state as a hub for collaborative research that is well placed to shape and create the jobs of the future for Western Australians. Thank you very much. Thanks, Linda, and thank you for uh, an insight to uh, the West Australian government's commitment uh, to research and particularly mine closure. Uh, I can't see any questions in the Q&A. I don't know whether there are any. Uh, Linda, if I could perhaps um, throw one to you then. I was really interested uh, and have been following what's happening in Collie, given that it's a very significant investment by uh, the West Australian government. And I guess this goes back to Andy Lloyd's comments earlier in the, uh, the keynote, that government's role in Collie has been very, very important. It has actually driven that transformation. 
given that success record, do you foresee that there will be future commitments as large and as, um, I guess, up to your elbows uh, in it in other communities? Or, or do you see this as being uh, a template for other communities to emulate without government? Um, thanks, Fiona. Um, look, I think the, the just transition process and the just transition plan, uh, I think is something that certainly has served the colleague community well. I think each transition needs to be considered in its own right and uh, with the key stakeholders impacted and involved in that process. But I think the just transition process and plan provides a model uh, for which uh, communities uh, in Western Australia and certainly in the regional um, aspects of Western Australia can consider how they might effectively transition from the dominant economy that they have and the dominant employer that they have to other potential, um, other potential partnerships um, whilst retaining and sustaining that local community uh, in an effective way. Um, uh, so, you know, for, for an example, um, in, a, in another sector not related to mining, but uh, we are also sort of working on a just transition plan at the moment uh, around forestry and the native, uh, native growth forest transition. Um, and that is building out a just transition sort of uh, plan. Uh, there is funding allocated to support that. Um, and there is a transition group that's been set up to steer that, which is made up of uh, government, local government, the local chambers of commerce and um, industry, uh, the development commissions, uh, uh, our TAFE and training partners, uh, the unions are involved in that. Um, and we have representation from a number of a number of sort of government agencies as well to support um, and secure and uh, you know, promulgate sort of feedback from the communities into that process to develop out um, individual and uh, key plans uh, associated with you know workforce, business, community sort of impact. So it's it's definitely from the Collie learnings we are we are building on that framework to grow and leverage that sort of approach uh, for transitions that need to occur not just in mining but in other sectors as well. Mm. Mm. Um, thank you, Linda. I'd now um, perhaps like to invite um, to the stage, um, oh, sorry, the presentation from Dawn Brock. Uh, and this session really is an international session because Dawn uh, has sent us her um, presentation from South Africa. Uh, Dawn joined the International Council on Mining and Metals, uh, ICMM, in 2017 and she leads on the mine closure and uh, water project work. She also works across other program areas, including tailings and community support. ICMM as an organisation, it's international. It brings together 27 mining and metal companies and over 30 regional and commodity associations with the aim of strengthening environmental and social performance and enhancing the mining industry's contributions to society. Dawn has a Master of Science degree in Environmental Science from Fitzwaterstrand University in South Africa and also holds a Bachelor of Science and Honours degree in Conservation and Biodiversity. She has a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science and Economics, both of which are from Rhodes University in South Africa. So um, could we please have Dawn's presentation? Good morning to everyone that has joined today and a big thank you to the CRC time team for inviting me to present today. I'm Dawn Brock and I lead on the closure and water work at the International Council on Mining and Metals. And today I'm just going to be providing a short summary of an assessment that we recently undertook with the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining and Metals, a government association, to understand the challenges of mine closure from an industry and government perspective. So just to set the scene, as we all know, there are only a few examples globally of mines that have received closure certificates and that have successfully been transferred to government or third party. As a global mining and metals association, we want to understand the reasons behind this, what are the challenges and what needs to be undertaken to overcome these challenges. So in 2018, we start the process by undertaking a survey of our ICMM members to assess the status and profile of mine closures across its membership. 
Although there are several new mines coming on stream on an ongoing basis, the survey found that over the next 25 years, more than 40% of operations that responded to the survey are expected to close, and almost 20% are expected to close in the next 10 years. As part of the survey, we also sought to understand the top closure risks for our members, with regulatory uncertainty and the relinquishment of assets coming out as the top three risks across majority of the jurisdictions that we surveyed. So again, we wanted to find out what the reason for this was. And together with the Intergovernmental Forum or IGF, we developed a survey to understand IGF's member government's readiness for these expected mine closures and also to understand the challenges from a government perspective. So what we found from the two surveys was that while governments are aware of the importance of mine closure, many do not have the policies, regulations, or enforcement, as well as capacity to manage and regulate closure. Only 45% of countries that responded to the survey require adequate financial assurance, which is obviously a major risk for those jurisdictions. We also found that both government and industry stakeholders are still grappling with the social challenges of mine closure. From this ICMM survey, we found that 43% of the ones expected to close in the next 25 years have a high to very high relative contribution to the local and regional economy. So this suggests that if mine closure is not planned and regulated properly, this could have substantial impacts on the local mine communities. The IGF survey highlighted that less than a quarter of governments reported a high level of community involvement in developing and implementing mine closure plans. And Rob Stevens from IGF will be speaking about this in a bit more detail in the presentation after this. Further challenges common to both industry and government include inadequate or uncertain policy and regulatory landscape obscuring the responsibilities and expectations of both industry and regulators. For example, the pathway or process to relinquish a closed mine site is often uncertain, even in some of the world's leading mining jurisdictions. It was also identified that there is a lack of experience in closing mines from both industry and government perspective. And for some governments, the lack of human resources to manage mine closure, which is also hindering progress. However, it's not all doom and gloom, and I don't just want to focus on the challenges. While governments need to ensure they dedicate sufficient resources to manage mine closure, there are opportunities to learn from the expertise and experience that exists within industry, also within consulting companies, development agencies, and non-governmental organizations. We've seen a lot of international best practice recently coming out with recent guidance documents produced by ICMM, the IGF. We've also seen government actually producing some of their own sort of guidance documents on this, as well as the Asia Pacific Economic Corporation and the World Bank, both releasing documents to assist in terms of mine closure. These can help both industry and government to benchmark their current approaches and advance their state of practice. The availability of these resources also gives mining companies a clear responsibility to implement best practices, regardless of the context in which they are operating. We also see some really great examples around the world. For example, here, the Mine Water Coordinating Body in South Africa, although still a work in progress, it's a great example of a collaborative model that brings together government and industry to work together to achieve sustainable benefits for Bumalanga region in South Africa post mine closure. To date, the MWCP has attracted Tungela, ESCOM, uh, the power generators, Xara Resources, Glencore, Sassel and South32 as private sector partners and is working really closely with the departments of water and sanitation Department of Mineral Resources and the Mpumalanga Province Department of Economic Affairs and Tourism, who are all key government bodies governing the mining sector. They have a number of collaborative projects that are underway, including Mine Water for Irrigation Project, which aims to obtain buy-in from regulators on the use of mine water for irrigation purposes 
in order to create li livelihood opportunities for local communities. Currently, regulations in South Africa surrounding mine closure as well as water use do not allow sort of for niche or innovative opportunities to take place due to the le legislative barriers surrounding these. So the MWCB is working really closely with government departments to bring them in on the project early on to obtain that buy -in and also to bring them along on the journey so that they can look to see how this sort of these niche projects and opportunities can actually become something that continues into the future and that mining companies can look to seek for these opportunities and not be held back by some of the legislative barriers. So in conclusion, there's a wave of pending mine closures that requires industry and government to keep mine closure front of mind and work together to learn from each other's experience and gain lessons from previous closures to address the outstanding challenges. So both the ICMM and IGF are supporting this process with the development of best practice guidance, training materials, and facilitating discussions at the regional level to, in order to drive these post-closure planning. And through groups like the CRC Time, we hope to see this happening in many other areas and to ensure that we have responsible and successful mine closures in the future. Thank you very much for listening to me today. We'll now move uh, to Dr. Rob Stevens. Uh, he has given us his Sunday evening. It's uh, currently uh, almost seven o'clock in um, British Columbia and Canada. Rob is a, prof a professional geologist and a technical project director, policy advisor, educator and facilitator for the mineral exploration and mining sector. He's the author of the best-selling book, Mineral Exploration and Mining Essentials, that provides a comprehensive overview of the mining industry. He's been a professor and associate dean at the British Columbia Institute of Technology and a director of international programs at the Canadian International Resources and Development Institute at the University of British Columbia and the vice president of technical and regulatory policy at the Association for Mineral Exploration in Vancouver. Rob has led and managed the development of guidance documents related to mine closure, engagement with Indigenous uh, groups and reclamation in mining exploration. He's led international training programs on mine closure and managed the development of a master's degree in ecological restoration and an undergraduate degree in mining and mining resource engineering. Rob is passionate about the mineral exploration and mining industry and enjoys the mix of science, engineering, business, community, discovery and entrepreneurialism that are integral to the industry. So thank you, Rob, for giving us um, your Sunday evening and for participating in this forum. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. And uh, good morning, everybody. As uh, Fiona said, I'm coming to you today uh, from Vancouver in British Columbia and on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, and specifically where I'm located, the Quiquitlam uh, First Nations. And I'm happy to be here Sunday evening or otherwise. Uh, so I'd really like to thank the CRC Time uh, organizers for this opportunity uh, to speak with you this morning and to be part of this regional economic development session. So this is part two of the presentation uh, in which we're looking at the mine closure challenges for government and industry. Uh, that is based on an opinion piece that the IGF and ICMM published uh, about a month ago. And we just saw Don Brock's presentation uh, on the, that is the first part of this a two part presentation where she focused on some of the challenges faced uh, by industry and government, as well as some of the examples uh, with collaboration. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more specifically on the government side and elaborate uh, in a little bit more detail on, on what we presented uh, in that opinion piece. So first of all, maybe I should just tell you who the IGF is. Uh, so the IGF is the Intergovernmental Forum on Mining, Minerals, Metals, and Sustainable Development. Quite a mouthful for an organization. So you can see why we just call it IGF. It's a voluntary government initiative created through the UN in 2005 and currently has 79 member countries. 
The IGF is dedicated to improving mineral governments and to help achieve the UN's sustainable development goals. And how do we help governments? Well, importantly, uh, we do in-country uh, in policy assessments that are benchmarked to the IGF's mining policy framework. We also do capacity building, technical assistance and training in country, develop guidance for governments and serve as a convening organization with uh, conferences and events. Now, as Don mentioned, uh, the survey of ICMM members indicated that there are a large number of mines that are likely to reach the end of their life and close in the coming years. So in order to understand how prepared governments are for these mines, the IGF undertook a survey of its members in 2019 and 2020, and also did a review of the mining policy assessments that it had completed uh, in collaboration with its member governments uh, since 2014. And this resulted in the publication of a paper called The Current Status of Mine Closure Readiness, Are Governments Prepared? Uh, that was released by the IGF about two months ago, and you can find it on their website. Between the survey and the assessments, um, we have a total of 30, uh, or the IGF has current mine closure readiness information on 30 countries that span right across the globe that you can see on this table here and also countries that span the full range of development as measured by the Human Development Index. So what did we find out uh, in this study? When we looked at, are mine closure plans required? We found that 76% of the countries do indicate that there is a formal legal requirement for mine closure plans to be submitted as part of permitting and mine operation. So at first pass, you know that's a pretty good number, we're up to 76% uh, around the world of countries requiring mine closure plans. But when we looked at the assessments in a little bit more detail, what we found is that the level of detail and rigor required in those plans and the level of scrutiny that those plans undergo by the regulator is, uh, is highly variable and in, re in reality is quite insufficient in a number of jurisdictions. We also looked at is final financial assurance required. And in that, we found that 45% of countries do require the full amount of financial assurance um, uh, to, uh, based on the estimated mine closure costs uh, for closure. But then 14% don't require any financial assurance at all. And interestingly, the data also show that there is limited correlation between financial assurance uh, requirements and the Human Development Index. While it might expect, we might expect that more developed countries that have stronger financial assurance policies, um, um, we might expect, sorry, that more developed countries would have stronger financial assurance policies, but that was not borne out by the data. We find that countries that are rated high or very high on the Human Development Index require, uh, in some cases, the full amount of financial assurance, but in other cases, they don't require any financial assurance at all. And we also looked at what is the level of community involvement in shaping mine closure plans and the post mining transition. So about a quarter of uh, the countries indicated that there is a high level of communities in the development of plans and the implementation of closure. But at the same time, 37% indicated that there is no requirement uh, uh, for in the, the involvement of communities in establishing those plans um, or implementing uh, mine closure. And Don mentioned that the ICMM survey indicated that many of the mines that are closing have a, uh, in the coming years, have a high to very high contribution uh, to the local economy. And thus closure of these mines could have a significant social impact if not managed carefully in consultation with and with the involvement of communities. So what are some of the challenges with government becoming mine closure ready? Uh, well, one of the first things we found was capacity and experience. In almost all cases, we found that government does not have sufficient human resources or financial uh, capacity to fully implicant, uh, implement their mine closure policies. As mentioned, community involvement, um, you know, which was outlined in the previous uh, slide. The involvement of communities and the consideration of the social impacts of mine closure still have a long way to go and to support the long-term economic development of those mining communities. Regulations and guidance, 
many jurisdictions have outdated, incomplete, or weak guidance and regulations related to closure and environmental manage management that really need to be mo modernized. Financial assurance, as we indicated earlier, we really, uh, governments need to ensure that they're holding the full financial assurance uh, to backstop uh, mine closure costs in case uh, the proponent or the mine operator does not fully close that mine. And then relinquishment, and this is an important one. Many mine closure policies and regulations lack a clear process for the relinquishment of the mine site back to government or an alternative land holder. And that includes major mining jurisdictions such as Australia or Canada. In my mind, mining can't truly meet the principles of sustainable development without a clear path to relinquishment. So what are some of the policy implications or actions for government to address these? Well, I think governments need to attain their quote, social license to maintain and grow their mining sector. That's a term we often see associated with industry, but I do think if, if governments do wanna maintain and grow their sector, they have to demonstrate that they can manage the financial, environmental and social impacts of mining and mine closure. You need to ensure there's sufficient human and financial resources within government to regulate closure. You need to develop the modern uh, policies to manage mine closure. And you can draw upon some of the excellent guidance material that's available. Uh, Don showed a couple, here's a couple of others. And I think also uh, from states or provinces, uh, such as some of the guidance that's being developed in Western Australia uh, can serve as great models for countries to adopt. And I think the governments should be harnessing mine closure expertise in industry, civil society, and academia. And I might really focus on industry because I think probably some of the leading expertise, if not the, the leading expertise in mine closure lies within industry and the people are actually implementing mine closure on the ground. And then I'll just come back to relinquish, uh, relinquishment again, which I think is really important. I think governments need to work with industry to establish clear processes for the relinquishment of mines. So thank you very much. It's been uh, a great uh, opportunity to speak with you today. And uh, I will turn it back to um, Fiona now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rob. Um, th are there any questions? I can't see any questions there. Um, I just, perhaps I can, we've just got uh, a little over two minutes, but I'd just like to ask you, Rob, um, we we get this sort of um, argy-bargy, to use an Australian um, uh, colloquialism, where we have governments that say, well, you know, it's very difficult to move to that relinquishment stage because governments continue to um, hold on to their assets in the hope that perhaps market prices may improve or technology will enable uh, their operations to be more economic. And then governments, uh, sorry, and then companies will say, well, uh, uh, there, there's too much um, uh, government red tape that enables uh, or facilitates closure. So how do we move beyond this um, sort of, um, I guess, impasse that doesn't uh, enable us to achieve what the communities want, and that's um, to repurpose for a productive mm -hmm. future? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, a, a great question. I mean, as a geologist, uh, I always say there's always more resource to be found. So that's always a tricky one. Uh, you know, most mine sites, it's rare that you can really say it's fully depleted. So I fully get why, you know, you want to keep those areas potentially available for redevelopment. Um, I think one of the key things with relinquishment that, that I see as a challenge is the, um, that governments don't want to take the risk of, um, issues that might arise in the future that they will then become responsible for uh, all the costs and the you know the the concerns that will be expressed by communities around that and i think it, it's one thing that we've had some discussions with uh, with icmm and also internally at the igf and one of those i think is that um, governments are going to need some long-term uh, financial assurance essentially to help backstop those challenges that could arise in the future uh, and that we don't know right now. And that will maybe give them the freedom, you know, to do what the communities are looking for. And if you find something that you can redevelop in the future, um, well, maybe you have to disturb some of that reclamation or rehabilitation work that's been done.
but you know that's okay that's uh at least the work is being done um you know to satisfy those communities so mm. yeah mm. Yeah, very timely. Thank you, Rob. Uh, well, thank you very much uh, for your contribution, Rob, and also to Linda here in Perth and to Dawn in South Africa. Um, it's been a very useful um, first session uh, for the three pro the four programs that we run um, at the CRC. So thank you, and um, we will uh, turn over to uh, the producers.